Nice to have you back here. Nice to be here. Uh, what an interesting book you've written. It, it, it hits the bookstores tomorrow. We've got you here right now. When did you know you, first of all, you wanted to put out a book that was going to out the secret vernacular of doctors? About a year and a half ago, um, Harper Collins, my publisher, asked me to write a book, and they were hoping I was going to come up with something like Jerome Groupman's book, How Doctors Think. So uh, they said, you know, could you could you write about the the language that doctors use? And I uh, and I envisioned it as a book. Uh, think of it as how doctors talk. Um, I began with the jargon, code blue and primary pulmonary hypertension, you know, PPH and 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 postpartum hemorrhage, and there's another PPH and and DM2, which is type two diabetes, and that got boring after a while. What was far more interesting is the slang, which has a fancy name. It is algo or argot, which, which is, which is the, the secret language. It comes from Les Argotiers, circa 1628, a language used by robbers and thieves so that bystanders, their victims, um, would not necessarily know what they were saying. This secret language of doctors goes back that far, centuries. Uh, the concept of a secret language, there's a secret language of lawyers, hunters, stockbrokers, teachers, journalists, broadcasters, of course there is. Do we have a secret language? <laughs> Why hasn't anyone taught me this secret language? I guess we sort of do. Uh, spe let's talk about the doctors, though, because this has some important implications for those of us. Uh, all of us eventually end up in a uh, with a doctor or in, a, in a hospital. Give me an example. Pretend you're reading my chart, but instead of using a medical term, use the secret language and don't be gentle. Go ahead, say something. Well, okay, very interesting that you say that. Um, there was a time in the past, maybe up to about 10 years ago, when it was not uncommon to see in some charts an awful three letters, F-L-K, which stands for funny-looking kid. And that was actually written in charts, particularly British charts, because the Brits have a wicked um, grasp of slang that, that, that makes North American uh, use of slang pale by comparison. People actually wrote that in charts. Things like UBI, unexplained beer injury, uh, or uh, you know, the, the, the fact that people arrive at the hospital with, with, uh, with injuries that, and they happen to be intoxicated at the same time. Um, what's interesting is that, is that Adam Fox, uh, a pediatric hematologist about 10 years ago, um, said that slang was dead because people were no longer writing it in charts because if it, they were subpoenaed and you had to explain this on the witness stand, it would be not only embarrassing, you'd probably lose your case, but it's become oral. People speak it, and it doesn't disappear. And I and 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 that's a very important point. You don't make slang disappear by by ordering people to to make it disappear. Give me a couple of more examples. Okay. Just a, uh, Modern day slang that I un, that I uncovered. Yeah. Um, slang for morbidly obese patients. We call them bariatric patients. People with a high BMI over forty or forty five or fifty who weigh five hundred to six hundred pounds. Whales, seals. Um, now, if you wrote that in a chart, everybody would know what you were saying. Yeah. But what if they said this person is uh, Chicago 3 plus or three clinic units? Well, if you know the slang, that's trope. The one equals 200 pounds. So if someone is Chicago 3 plus, they're saying that the patient weighs 300 pounds without actually saying it. Or three clinic units is 600 pounds. Now, I never heard anybody use that term in, or that kind of trope in Canada, but in the United States where they have a, a, a lot more patients who are morbidly obese, I heard it a lot. Well, in, in your book, you, you give much of the credit for this, this sort of secret language to a Dr. Stephen Bergman and his novel, The House of God. Why is that book so important? How did that help spread the Dr. Slang? I'd like to say that Stephen Bergman or Samuel Shem um, was kind of, you could call him the catalyst or you could say that he was the virus that infected the medical profession. Up until about 1978 when the book was published, there was a, there was a smattering of words. Um, and anesthesiologists were called gas passers. Orthopedic surgeons were called bone docs. Um, uh, urologists were called plumbers. But it was pretty tame stuff. And then the House of God had words like gomer, which was a patient with often elderly uh, with dementia. It's an acronym that in his book he wrote stands for get out of my emergency room. I, I explore the etymology. On the, that's an East Coast derivation. On the West Coast, it was grand old man of the ER. In the United States, it was Gomer after Gomer Pyle. And for those who don't know it, long before Forrest Gump, there was Gomer Pyle, a uh, 1960s right. sitcom, and, and, and for the Gomer old simpleton. It was the idea that, that, that he was unpacking in that word was the patient uh, who receives a lot of treatment for, for, who will never be restored 
to, to a good quality of life, and so it's futile. And, and so it, it was representative of the futility that exists today that, that a lot of physicians feel when they're treating patients right. where the family hasn't signed to do not resuscitate. Uh, and, and so Stephen Bergman um, went from publisher to publisher trying to, to, to find somebody to publish the book. Eventually in 78 he did. It was based, it was a novel based on his year as an intern at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And he sold a few hundred, then a few thousand. Around about 1980 it started to take off. And now 30, 35, 36 years later, more than two million copies of the book are in print. Well, the examples you're giving, I mean, they, they, they really are, they sound or they are offensive or, or they make doctors sound really crass. I know that there are practical applications of, of this language, though, and I, I'll ask you about that in a moment. First of all, how did that book change your own view of medicine and how to talk about it? Like everybody else at the time, and I mean everybody else, um, I was handed the book and said, you should check this out. Uh, and, and I found that a lot of my colleagues were inventing uh, slang. Um, I worked in a pediatric hospital, and I heard people in inventing slang and adapting the House of God rules to the pediatric population. Um, it changed me because this was a book that spoke to me about my own frustrations about, about health care, about, about futility, about the lack of humanity, often the lack of empathy. And these are themes that continue to today. Uh, the ambivalence that we feel about doing a full-bore resuscitation on somebody when we can't bring them back to a good quality of life. Uh, and and so it, 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 it set me on a path, uh, on a path of discovery of the culture of modern medicine. And uh, what I found in writing the book was I wanted to kind of revisit some of the themes in the House of God and ask, has slang died? And no, it hasn't. There are hundreds of words where there were just a, about a dozen in that book. There's a guy named Dr. Peter Cusson you talk about who, who considers Dr. Slang to be almost poetic or musical. Uh, he's he's someone who's another influential figure in the history of the development of of medical slang. Yes, he is. Yeah, he's at Duke University, which is strange because he's he's a, a New York Jew who uh, is very much a fish out of water at uh, at uh, at Duke University, which is button down, necktie or or, or, or bow tie culture. Uh, but he uh, has been going around the country talking about you know the, the language of medicine, what he worries about in, in efforts to eradicate slang. That what that what we're doing is taking the poetry out of the work that we do, the wit. Um, there's, to him, there's nothing better than a witty phrase of slang. And mm. to him, uh, Yellow Submarine, which is a, a one I'd never heard until he said it to me, which is, which is on one level is a horrible way of describing a patient. It's not slang that I would use. So for me, it was a voyage of discovery. But to him, it was, you know, it's ironic. And tell us what Yellow Submarine means. Yellow Submarine refers to um, a large uh, patient with alcoholic liver disease who has a big belly because of ascites, because they've got fluid on their belly. Uh, and, and I guess a submarine because they're, they're, they're often supine in bed. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, if you said this stuff publicly or if people knew, um, it's really offensive stuff in a lot of cases. Absolutely now, it is. Uh, I mean, obviously there are components of humor and maybe psychological self-preservation involved here, having, having a laugh to stay sane in a stressful environment and all that. Beyond that, why does this le secret language exist? The language exists for a number of reasons. I guess one is that you can unpack a lot of information or pack up a lot of information into a short number of phrases. Um, and, and, so, and that's very handy when you're at handover rounds, sign out rounds at the end of the day and you're a resident. And, and uh, you don't have to spend an hour explaining what's going on with each patient. So that, that, that's, one, that's one thing. Shorthand. And everybody has shorthand. Uh, I would Just uh, on that note, aren't there already medical terms that help create shorthand? I mean, why do we need slang? Uh, I don't think that there is shorthand that, that uh, is in any way similar to circling the drain. Circling the drain is more than just cl close to death. It's, uh, it's that uh, this is somebody who we're beginning to withdraw treatment. Um, the family knows about it. Um, it's a hard situation. We're hanging in there with the family. There's a whole right, bunch of compassion right, right, that actually right. that goes into that phrase. It's not just re referring to the, the, the physical condition. It's referring to the actual situation. Absolutely. Okay. So that's, so that's, so that's one important purpose for, for slang. Um, it uh, is part of the bonding experience. You know, if you've been up all night, uh, there, there, it doesn't always feel as if there's a lot of satisfaction in doing that. Or if you've been having one rough, you know, one rough situation after another, one trauma after another, you're losing patience, you're, you're losing yourself, you know, you're, you're losing your compassion. There's all kinds of things that are going on inside you. And to be able to share it with others, 
It's also part of the bonding experience. I talk about it in the book. The first time that, that my chief resident, my senior resident, came up to me and said to Brian, said, Brian, you know, after my first night on call, how many patients did you box last night? Yeah. And I almost fell down when he said it until the smile, you know, the creases of the smile formed on his face. I realized he was joking, and I was flattered. Box means kill, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, put in a box and that, to be to be put into that uh, to be to be to, did, to get the secret handshake. Did this coded language or does this coded language help you do your job better? Yes, and I'll tell you why. The slang symbolizes the frustrations that we feel and uh, about the work that we do. Uh, health professionals are among the most ethically grounded people on the planet, but that doesn't mean they don't have frustrations. And, and you know, I'd put it to you, I've had people who've said to me, I haven't heard these words, and, and I, I would suggest that, that this may be a healthy way of dealing with frustration bordering on rage about the situations that we have around us uh, as opposed to just bottling it up inside and, and, and screaming at your family when you get home. But what do you think the, the secret doctor's language says about the relationship between doctors and patients? Um, sometimes they're frustrated. Sometimes physicians are frustrated by, by patients or they're frustrated by situations uh, that they can't control. An example, um, uh, patients who, there's, there's the phrase, you mentioned it, status dramaticus, which is being in a perpetual state of, uh, of drama uh, in the emergency department, it might be it might be the patient, uh, the patient, yeah. the patient who is well. There may be there actually may be allied health professionals who do that, but that, this is somebody who is dramatizing their symptoms and they won't stop. And and you know, is that an important thing to to talk about? Yeah, it is because. Uh, uh, casual observers in the emergency department as they watch us run back and forth can't help but notice that the amount of time we spend with a patient is not always directly proportional to the gravity of their illness. It may be because they're more anxious. And, and so they see that, that dealing with an anxious patient often takes more time than to deal with other patients. You're someone who's very concerned with ethics. We hear that on your radio program. We, see, I, we read that in this book. Does it bother you that the secret language has become so ubiquitous in medicine, and, and what are some of the codified terms you just can't abide? Cockroach, talking about somebody who returns again and again to the emergency department. Um, a patient, and these are awful words, let me preface this by saying if I ever heard anybody using that, I'd pull them aside and, and talk to them, but I'd also say, where's this coming from? But another one that I heard... In but the, you know people use these words. Not around me, but uh, I interviewed hundreds of residents and attending physicians, allied health professionals who use slang. You know, anybody who says that slang's gone, um, read the book. It's, it's there. Rock. Referring to a patient, usually in the United States, who by virtue of legislation and a whole bunch of state and federal rules cannot be removed from that ward. Often referring to an itinerant farm worker uh, who does not have legal status because they're not a landed immigrant, often from Mexico, who's uh, injured in a farming accident, has to be admitted to hospital, receives all kinds of intensive care, their bones are fixed, they're still on a ventilator, and they can't be removed because they have no fixed address because they're not a landed immigrant, so they can't go anywhere because of legislation. And the people who look after them will actually call them rocks. And if they have two or three rocks in a ward, they call that a rock garden. So I, oh, well, I know so, it's all so it's dehumanizing. I'm, I'm it's confused terrible. though because on the one hand, you it, it sounds like you you lament the, how ubiquitous this slang has become. On the other hand, you just talked about how it helps to do the job better, and it's an important bonding experience for doctors. Well, so you know how how do you how do you deal with your frustration about about that that kind of situation that I've just described? Um, it's a hard one, and but you have to talk about your frustration because if you don't, you know maybe that becomes the impetus to do something about it, like pass another law. And and hospitals are passing laws that are making it easier uh, to find more compassionate ways of dealing with patients who are formerly known as rocks. I'll give you another example: those morbidly obese patients. You may be saying that your hospital doesn't have stretchers that can take the weight of a 600-pound person, so buy them. Um, buy the lift that can lift them so that you don't have a resident trying to lift a patient off a floor and blowing a disc in their neck, which, which and that's happened. So, and 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 there, I can give you many more examples. Uh, the contempt that that internists sometimes feel for having to manage the non-surgical problems of orthopedic patients. There's actually a slang term, "fuba," found on orthopedics barely alive, and it's used. Sometimes by internists, I heard about it, you know, I've never heard it used around me, but used um, to describe um, the 5 p.m. Friday afternoon phone call in which 
Um, there's a, a call to the internist on, 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 on call, come quick, come to the patient in the orthopedics ward who is in congestive heart failure because they've been given too many fluids by the orthopedic surgeons. And so, you know, the, the, the lore right, is right, that the orthopedic right. surgeon is more interested in fixing the bones. Now, there's been a fix to that problem. Now we have hospitalists, hospitalists who take care of the non-orthopedic needs of, of patients who've had surgery. And this is happening all over North America. So the, so the slang helped to identify a problem that led to a solution. I've got two minutes left with you here, so let's be uh, economical, but I want to get to these questions. With this book, you're letting the greater public, me, in on your profession's secret code, right? I go to a hospital now or a doctor, I'm going to be looking out for it. What happens when we start understanding it, those of us who are not doctors? Is that good or bad? I think it's great because I think it leads to more conversations. And the more you talk about stuff, you know, the more, uh, and, and we're trying to be a more open profession. I did a TED talk about mistakes I've made. Uh, you know, we need to talk about them. What about doctors, other doctors, other than you? Are they going to be angry at you? They might. Have you heard from them? I've had the odd one who said, I've never heard this slang spoken in 10 or 15 years. You don't believe them? Uh, no, I don't believe them. And even if they do, so the frustrations are real and they need to be dealt with. And, uh, and, and I think open communication is the best way to do it. Keeping it secret. Well, a wise person once said to me, it's in the secrets that lie the sickness. You referred to it earlier, but you didn't actually use the term. Explain to us, uh, with a minute left here, what Hollywood code is, because this was the one that really got me. Yeah, Hollywood code is, is uh, or slow code, light blue, blue light code. This is, it looks like you're doing a full resuscitation when you aren't. Um, and, and, and that comes from uh, the belief by, by, the, uh, by the health professional that doing a full code with CPR and, and ventilators and, and intubation would be cruel to the patient and would be futile. But somehow the patient or the family hasn't signed family. a do not, do not resuscitate. And, and it's unethical. I think you should be telling uh, patients or their family you know, what you think the situation is and what you're prepared to offer rather than doing a Hollywood code. It's fascinating stuff. It certainly pulls uh, a peek behind the curtain of your profession. Uh, um, I think it's going to be a book a lot of people talk about. Thank you for this. Nice to see you here. My pleasure.